In this video, I'm going to discuss edge effects and how to deal with them by having buffer zones and thinking about buffer zones when creating your data epochs. So let me start by reminding you what edge effects are and why they can introduce artifacts into your time frequency analysis. So here you see a plot of time frequency power, and it doesn't matter what's going on in the middle. What I want you to focus your attention on is these red demons here on the side, all the way on the left and all the way on the right. These are edge effects, they are artifacts, and they are contaminating, they're overriding the other signals, the other features that are actually happening in the EEG data. So where do these edge effects come from? Well, they come from having uh, taking a time frequency representation or decomposition of an edge, of a sharp edge that looks something like this. Now, you learned in the section on the Fourier transform that when you have a sharp non-stationarity in the time domain signal, you need, or the Fourier transform, needs a lot of energy at a lot of frequencies to represent that really sharp edge. And of course, ultimately, wavelet convolution is basically just Fourier transforms. So here what you see is the time domain signal here. And this is time frequency power and time frequency phase of this edge. So it's pretty remarkable that there's nothing happening in the signal except for this one little blip. And look at this ginormous time frequency response that it generates. So you can imagine if something like this is in your data, then you're going to get this. Now, this is kind of as expected. This isn't really wrong per se. This is the correct answer. However, these edge effects can be so large that they will overwhelm whatever is the time frequency dynamics that are happening in the signal. Obviously, there's nothing happening in this signal, but you can imagine that if this kind of an edge is superimposed on top of your EEG signal, that this is going to be really difficult. This is going to add an artifact that's going to make it difficult to interpret what's actually happening endogenously in the signal that was coming from the brain. Okay, so what can you do about edge effects? Unfortunately, there isn't really a whole lot that you can do. They are just present. They are just a natural feature of the way the Fourier transform works by decomposing this signal into sine waves. So therefore, the solution is to, let me go back to this slide, the solution is to accept that edge effects will be present, and you just make sure that those edge effects are not going to contaminate the time windows that you are interested in. So, and that is related to cutting your epochs, so cutting your continuous data into epochs. So of course, when you record your EEG data, it's being recorded continuously, and you get this two-dimensional data set, well, assuming you have multiple uh, channels, then you get a two-dimensional data set of continuous time by trials. And continuous time, you know, this might be an hour of recording or half an hour of recording, so this can be a really long time series. And then, the idea is that one of the initial steps of pre-processing your data are to identify the uh, timing of different events that happened in the experiment, or if it's spontaneous data or resting state data, you might still cut up the data into, let's say, two, se two second segments, and then you cut epochs around each of these events, and these form your trials. So this would be the data frame from trial one. You can see it's time by trials, and then it's time, time lock due. You know, maybe this was when a picture appeared on the computer screen. So trial one, trial two, up to trial n. Now here's the thing. There are edges all over the place in these data. There are edges here at the end of the trial. There are edges here in the beginning of the trial. And if you create these super trials by concatenating all the individual trials together into one really long trial, remember that's one of the tricks I showed to speed up convolution, then there are going to be edges in the data between you know this time point and this time point so the end of uh, the the la the end of the data boundary at uh, one trial and the beginning of the data boundary on the next trial but even without these uh, super trials without trial concatenation you're still going to get edges at the boundaries just like what you see here 
So that means that there will be edge effects contam potentially contaminating the data. Now, whether you get an edge effect that's really, really large or relatively small depends on the size of the edge relative to the other dynamics in the signal. So if the edge is really tiny and the, you know, the features in the signal are, are relatively large, the edge effect will be tiny and probably unnoticeable. But it can also happen that you get really large effects. It's difficult to know a priori whether you're going to have large or small edge effects. So that leads to two solutions, two possible ways of dealing with edge effects. And again, the idea is that you cannot eliminate edge effects. What you can do instead is come up with one of two strategies to make sure that the edge effects are not going to contaminate the part of the signal that you want to interpret. So the first solution is what I call the buffer zone approach. So essentially what you want to do is make sure that you cut your epochs sufficiently long. You want your epochs, your time epochs, your trials to be cut sufficiently wide such that the edge effects will totally subside by the time you get to the time window that you are actually interested in. So here you see we have data from minus 1,000 to plus 1,500, but I'm actually not interested in what's going on in this time window and in this time window. In fact, this time window might even overlap with the previous trial, and this time window might even overlap with the following trial. But that's totally fine. The only reason why the epochs are cut this long is so that the edge effects can fully subside before we get to the time period that I'm actually interested in, which is indicated by this gray box here. So how much time do you need for the buffer zone? Well, it's hard to compute exactly because the size of the edge effect depends on the data, not necessarily on the, the time window. That said, a recommendation that I typically give is to set the buffer zone to be three cycles at the lowest frequency that you are extracting out of the data. So for example, if the lowest frequency that you are extracting is 5 hertz, then three well one cycle at 5 hertz is 200 milliseconds. So three cycles at 5 hertz is 600 milliseconds. So therefore, if your epochs are 600 milliseconds long, I should say the buffer zone, 600 milliseconds long in the beginning, 600 milliseconds long at the end, I would say that is more than enough. You can sleep comfortably without ever worrying about edge effects contaminating your signal. And that's because these edge effects will generally subside in less than three cycles. Now, three is not a magic number. That's just my recommendation. It's just a rubric. In fact, when you look in uh, real data, when you see edge effects, they tend to decay in one cycle or less. So three cycles is even overdoing it a bit. But as I mentioned, if you have three cycles, you will never need to worry about edge effects. Okay, so this is my recommended procedure. I call it the buffer zone approach. The other possible way to deal with edge effects is what I call the clipping approach. And here, you don't have to worry so much about cutting large epochs, or you could say this would be a solution for if you are unable to cut really large epochs from the data. And here the idea is that you estimate what parts of the data could be contaminated by edge effects, and then you basically just remove those pixels from the time frequency plot. In practice, that can be done by setting the values to be NAN, so not a number, but that's just a you know detail of, of optional implementation. The idea is that you estimate what parts of the data might be contaminated by edge effects and you remove them so that they are definitely not interpreted. So in here as well, you could use, so this is from the uh, field trip website, it's from a field trip tutorial. And field trip, the field trip uh, MATLAB toolbox will implement this. And I don't know offhand how exactly they compute this clipping effect, but it might be one or two cycles at each frequency. You can see these lowest frequencies are basically with this size epoch, field trip has determined that we can't even really reliably estimate activity at this low frequency, whatever this is, maybe it's one or two hertz.